Good evening, everybody. Good um, evening. Just what we need in the middle of a pandemic is a nice cheerful topic, you know, to liven us up. Um, and uh, what I'm going to be talking about is basically our radioactive, our attempts, our failed attempts so far to, oops, somebody, I need to admit, um, uh, our failed attempts to deal with our radioactive waste disposal in the UK. And what I'll do is start off by looking at what our waste is, then look at what other people are doing with it and what general plans they are, and then look at our real attempts to do something, something with it. So where should we stick it? Um, uh, if I can get moving. I can't get my... Oops. There we go. The background. Why is it important that we deal with our nuclear waste? If, if by the way, shout if you can't hear me. Uh, if I'm too loud, shout again. Um, we have a toxic inventory, basically, of radioactive and elemental waste. That if it's released, if we just left it alone now, it would destroy the terrestrial environment around it, and it would destroy the local seas, which actually is the Irish Sea. It would head off into the North Atlantic and cause contamination for about a million years. And why we need to do something is because maybe our civilization will collapse, that's possible. We run out of money, nothing, to, and not able to do anything. Terrorist attack, there's a lot of plutonium involved in this, enough to wipe out cities quite comfortably. We need to deal with something like that. And of course there might be a fatal pandemic. And this slide I had arranged before this took, before the recent, the recent <laughs> pandemic. But supposing we had a pandemic that wiped out the people at Sellafield. Yes, you, um, mm. And so, um, we do need to do something about it. Oh, and, and of course, nuclear is a real public concern. We're all worried about nuclear. We know about Chernobyl. We know about cancers. We know about terrorism. We know about bombs. And people say we should or shouldn't have nuclear. The problem is with waste, we've been producing it since the 1950s. And we have the waste, it's a legacy waste. We have to do something about it. And it's really not part or not a full part of the nuclear debate. And we've had weapons, we've had every type of uh, power station, we reprocess it and we're producing hospital wastes. We had the first a nuclear power station, we had our first bomb, so we've been producing wastes for 70 years. And we probably have the large amount of very complex waste in the whole world because we've just had a bit of everything and we've had weapons. Nuclear power in the UK, you'll be well about, well familiar with, 21% of our power in the UK is uh, nuclear. We have 15 active reactors still producing waste and the power stations around the country are usually around on the sea. You'll probably know these names like Hasham, Hartlepool, Hunterston, Dunray, um, Sizewell, all very familiar, all coming to the end of their lives. By 2040, they, they'll all be expended. However, the UK in 2008 agreed to carry on with nuclear as part of its energy mix and eight sites were chosen for new nuclear power stations you're familiar that Hinkley power station down here in Somerset way Sizewell is next up and others though are getting cold feet because the lack of price guarantees for instance the big one that was due up near the Sellafield site um, more more side uh, has been uh, pulled out. So we have a nuclear future, quite how big it will be. So we are still going to be producing waste into the future. Now, where do these wastes come from? We talk about wastes like that, um, like they're sort of like something in a, coming out of a dustbin, but actually they come from the nuclear fuel cycle. And it's worth having a look at the kind of waste so you can see the kind of problem that we're dealing, dealing with. Now, the nuclear fuel cycle is very simply, 
You start with natural uranium, you convert it and enrich it to yes. make it into a nuclear fuel. Then we make fuel rods, we run it through a power plant, we get electricity, and then we reprocess some, so reprocess some of that fuel. And every single process here produces radioactive waste right from the beginning to the end. So the whole cycle produces wastes which are radioactive in different ways. Now, the one bit of the nuclear fuel cycle that is not directly relevant to the UK Thank you, Simon. You muted me. Okay. Can you all hear now? Yes, good. Thank you. Simon muted me. Um, he had enough, have you, Simon? Um, anyway, the part of the fuel cycle which and the waste we don't need to worry about is the mining. Although, morally, of course, this is where we get our uranium from. And quite a lot of it comes from Namibia. Big mine there. Big open cast mine. There are already 400 million tons of tailings, that's processing material, 900 million tons of waste rock, all exposed and all radioactive. And about half the total radioactive waste in the world is out there in mining, in mining situations. Every now and again, there we are. Uh, it's sorry every now and again it, it freezes um, uranium ores so how do they process uranium ores well uranium ores are very low grade generally and they take them out into a great big heap and then they pour, pour acid through them acid leaching and produce from it a leachate which is uranium oxide called yellow cake having said that if you're only 0.3% uranium, that means the rest of this is 99.7% is there left as waste. And of course, it's not completely leached. So that is one of the big volume waste problems of the world. Not for the UK, because we don't have any local uranium ore. Then it comes to the UK. And this is where we start our part of the nuclear fuel cycle and start producing our wastes. Natural uranium is two main isotopes, 238, 235. The isotope that you need to run a power station is uranium 235. And natural uranium is only 0.7% of the natural uranium. And you need it to run a reactor, it needs to be 3.5%. And so what you do is you turn your uranium oxide into a gas. And hold on, John White has eventually joined us. Hooray! Um, and you turn it into a gas, and then you put it through a whole load of diffusion tubes, continuously, miles and miles of these. And because the lighter isotope travels just a little bit faster than the heavier isotope, eventually it gets enriched enough to be 3.5% of the isotope. And when you get to that, you can precipitate it out. Just have to, every time somebody joins or unjoins, I get frozen, sorry. You can precipitate it out and you turn it into a pellet made of uranium oxide and that is what goes into your uh, power station. As part of the process, of course, you've got some uranium now that's depleted in uranium-235. We have 40,000 tonnes of this in the UK. Um, it's only 0.25% of the nice isotope. And we tend to use it in things like <coughs> missiles. You can fire it at tanks, goes through the walls of tanks, vaporizes everything inside the tank. Or we can use it as weights. If anybody's on a, been on a uh, 247, 
uh, sorry, 747, they wait, use the depleted uranium just to wait up the plane's wings because it's very dense and you don't need much of a volume. Now, the fuel, little pellets, get put into a casing, surrounded by casing, and a whole series of uranium pellets. It's cladding, which eventually will become very radioactive and will be a waste. They put that all these rods into an assembly, so a whole series of rods along with control rods, which control the nuclear reactions. And this is what goes into your nuclear power station. And of course, once used, every little bit is very radioactive. The casings, the control rods, the cage, all waste. But the hottest things and the real wastes the real worrying waste, or the one that we deal with, are the fuel rods. So this is uranium pellets that go into the, there's a nice, everybody hear the thunder? Um, there's a, a series of pellets. They go into your power station, into your nuclear reactor, and there the uranium-235 lets off neutrons, which have hit another uranium-235, and it fragments them. And this is where you get fission, enormous amount of energy, your nuclear energy, but also the worst isotopes, isotopes of simple elements like in uh, iodine and cesium and strontium, but these are very radioactive isotopes. Some of them have half-lives of milliseconds, others two years, 30, 40 years, that makes them unbelievably radioactive and very, very hot. They're giving off energy all the time. So they're the fission fragments, and they are short-lived, but also, as part of the process, the nuclear reactor, you get transuranics. These are things heavier than uranium. And what happens there is these neutrons that are being fired off get captured by the uranium-238, and you get plutonium, neptunium, americium. So you add neutrons, and you get these elements produced. These are long-lived isotopes, half-lives of thousands to hundreds of thousands of years. And they're very radioactive for a very long time. And so when we're looking at wastes, we have these um, radioactive isotopes to worry about, and then these very long-lived, not quite so radioactive, but um, again, long-lived isotopes to worry about. And that is, these are the worst wastes that we have to deal with. Now, after about two to three years, maybe four years, if you're lucky, the fuel is spent. And actually, it's not particularly contaminated, it's full of got about 3% of those fission products, those broken down isotopes, 1% 1, 1 plutonium, and the rest is the original uranium. But the rods themselves, not surprising, they've been in a nuclear reactor, are completely fried. And the rods that come out are a million times more radioactive than they went in. Very hot, very radioactive. Now, in the UK, we produce um, lots of spent fuel. That's the fuel that's used up after two to three years. And as I say, if you have 100 tons of fuel, uranium, 95 tons is still uranium, one ton plutonium, four tons um, are these fission products. And one way you can do is take those spent fuel just put them in a cooling pond and leave them and then try and dispose of them. But in the UK, we did a lot of reprocessing because what we tried to do, or what we did, is recover this uranium. We put it through the Thorpe reprocessing plant, um, six molar um, nitric acid at about six, 700 degrees centigrade, dissolved the rods, and then separated it out into reusable uranium, which we send around again. Um, for every 100 tons of uranium, you get one ton of plutonium. 
and you also get four tons of these fission products, which they evaporate, lovely process, evaporate and turn into glass. And these glasses are 20 million times more radioactive than the fuel rod went in. If you stuck one of these in the goal on the fields down by the school, the football fields, and Usain Bolt tried to run at a pile of that, his DNA would be fried long before he got there. These things are horrifically radioactive. The other thing is, of course, you're producing plutonium. And this is of interest to terrorists. Up at Sellafield, there's 120 tons of plutonium. And you only need a few kilograms to destroy a city. However, the question is, do we use this as waste or do we put it back as fuel and run power stations using this plutonium? Big discussion about what to do with uh, our plutonium. But all this is wastes. And nuclear fuel, used fuel, pro not processed, and these wastes are called high-level wastes. And just to remind you, there are also lower level wastes, everything that's involved in the nuclear reaction, there's a call to haul power station. These are all contaminated and are wastes. And I said the UK just has just about everything. We used to use a lot of graphite in our original reactors, still do some of our reactors. It was used to slow down those neutrons in the uh, nuclear uh, reactor because they would go, they, most of them go too fast and don't start a reaction. So you slow them down with something. We use graphite. And after a few years, the graphite, this is a, a top tomography study showing the holes in the graphite, in, a, in the graphite in a nuclear power plant. We have 80,000 tons of nuclear graphite full of these isotopes and they're desperately trying to leach them out so that you don't have to try and deal with this whole waste. You can try and deal with a, a much lesser volume. 80,000 tons of graphite, and of course graphite is not very dense. That's a very large volume. Where is most of our radioactive waste? Well, you could probably tell me. It's at Sellafield. Um, and this is the Sellafield site from the air. Uh, the Windscale Tower, which caught fire in 1957, called the Hall, the Thorpe Reprocessing Plant, 150 acres. And 70% by volume of our waste in this country is at Sellafield, 95% by radioactivity, because the power stations send all their used spent fuel to Sellafield. You may have seen these trains trundling across the countryside taking them up to Sellafield. So most of our waste is there. They go into cooling ponds up in Sellafield, are stored, waiting for us to decide what we're going to do with them. And Sellafield is often considered the most hazardous place in Europe. And, it's, uh, and I'll explain a little bit in a moment why it's so hazardous. Um, and they reckon it's 163 billion just to clean up the, the wastes at Sellafield. Everything you do in nuclear, it's not a million, it's a billion. You only have to sneeze and it costs you a billion, a billion pounds. And just to give you an idea, DEC, you probably know Department of Environment and Climate Change. This is their budget, a sort of donut chart. This is the amount of their budget that they have to spend on dealing with nuclear cleanup. So it's only a tiny bit for everybody else. So seven point, this was back in 2014, good as knows what is up by now. So everything in, in nuclear waste, everything in nuclear costs a fortune. How much waste have we got to deal with? Well, um, remember, we have high level wastes. Those are the ones which are extracted from fuel. We have spent nuclear fuel and we have intermediate level wastes. These are things like the casings and contaminated materials. And I don't know why they use these units, but the unit for high level waste is a double, is a London bus. And we have just 16 of them. 
very nasty, but we only have 16 to double decker buses worth. Spent fuel, the unit is an Olympic swimming pool. And we have about five Olympic swimming pools of nuclear fuel, uh, 12,000 meters cubed. An intermediate waste, the unit is the Royal Albert Hall. And we have a lot of those, 36, uh, 364 meters cubed of intermediate waste. And there's, so that's four Albert, Albert Halls. In terms of radioactivity, the intermediate and low level wastes, sorry, the lowest level wastes, we have 94% is by volume. Intermediate level waste, 6%. Now level waste, it's a tiny percentage by volume. But when you look at the radioactivity, the radioactivity of high level waste is, it's 95% of the radioactivity. So these are the wastes that we really have to worry about and deal with. And the question is, how long is it radioactive? And here, this is the plot, black here, that shows the radioactivity dropping off and for the fission products, those things which are very radioactive. After 300 years, they are less radioactive than natural uranium ore. Not totally unreactive, but they have dropped off. They drop off very quickly. But the, those transuranics, that plutonium, americium, and some other isotopes, there's selenium and other elements we know of, that doesn't cross that line till 300,000 years and doesn't really become safe where you could live with it for a million years. So our waste that we have at the moment is going to be radioactive for a million years. So what do we do with the waste? Well, cartoonists have had um, lovely fun with it. Dilbert, even the Simpsons have have tried to deal with radioactive waste, probably better than we have. But um, the question is, what do you do with the waste? And that is what we've been grappling with for the last, well, 70 years, 60 years. Now, early on, and this is why Sellafield is so expensive, we were trying to produce nuclear materials for bombs in the 50s. And places like Chapel Cross Power Station were producing so much waste so quickly, we, all we were doing was basically dumping it in water-filled ponds. This is a pond at Sellafield, concrete pond, pond beginning to crack, and it's called Dirty 30. Um, and they threw the waste in here to try and cool it down. But if you look at the bottom of the pond, it's a sludge now, a radioactive sludge. These are fuel rods. This is a sludge, which they are at the moment spending billions on trying to clean, clean up. So some of these early practices with nuclear waste were pretty poor. This is what they, the Dune Ray, this is the intermediate level waste at Dune Ray. Just put it in a can and put it in a pond. And so these are some of the legacies which are so costly that we are having to clean up. And of course, things like these are incredibly hot and you can't, pumping sludges, radioactive sludges, and trying to turn them into glasses, very, very tricky. We also, early on, um, we dumped it at sea. 35,000 terabecquerels is quite a lot of radioactivity. We put it in tins, and we dumped it. Quite often, deep out in the Bay of Biscay, these are different countries, so Germany, France, Belgium, Sweden, um, and here's Britain and Belgium here. We dumped it off even off Guernsey, would you believe? So we used to dump, dump it off in the sea. Some of these canisters are beginning to rust. Now, some of these are not particularly high radioactive waste, but they will hit the environment soon. Luckily, in high level waste dumping was stopped in 1972. All waste dumping, and that includes toxic wastes, was stopped in 1994. Now, back in 1976, and do remember the date, because you will see we haven't gone very far, Lord Flowers produced a report, Royal Commission, and he said that there should be no commitment to new nuclear 
until we have been able to deal with re out beyond reasonable doubt that we can do the self safe containment of long-lived highly radioactive waste, 1976. So he said, no more nuclear until we know how to deal with the waste. And he said, we need a national disposal facility. As a result of that, the government then said, right, lots of research on high level waste. Let's get an intermediate level waste disposal facility up and running. We'll get a committee, raw Mac, it's called Radiative Waste Management Committee, and they will deal with it. And a company, state-owned company, Nirex, will actually do it. The former chairman of raw Mac, he lives in Hope in Derbyshire, a colleague of mine, ex-colleague of mine. Anyway, Nirex decided they would do it their way, and they screened 333 sites, they chose them, around the UK, and then focused in on 11. Can everybody see that? I don't know why that. I have got, okay, we're back. Um, right, they focused on just 11 sites. Again, self-selected, Outer Hebrides, Dunray, somewhere in Norfolk, um, and they chose one site they said would be the best for this facility. Guess where it was? Sellafield. Oh, right next door to where most of the waste is. Now, if you look at the site they chose, was literally, there's the Sellafield site, there's the Irish Sea, this was it, Longlands Farm. They said that was the best place to put the waste. And they asked for planning permission to do a, a rock lab which would eventually become the waste laboratory. So amazing coincidence, the best place in Britain to put it was right next door to Sellafield. They did loads of um, investigation, probably a billion pounds worth at today's prices, 20 kilometers of core, and if you want to go look at them, they're down in Nottingham in the core store, six inch wide core, giant cores. They did some seismics, they did a lot of reports, but it went to a public inquiry and it was rejected. And the reason it was rejected is because the scientific research was incomplete. And they're quite right. What they did was they just picked what they wanted to look at and didn't look at the whole package, which is absolutely essential. And they set up as a result of this, they said, we can't trust Nirex, we need independent people. We'll search up research centers in Manchester, two research centers in Manchester, one in Leeds and one in Sheffield. And one of those research centers is what I was in, involved with at Manchester. Narex got the boot and the Nuclear Decommissioning Authority were brought in. And they had the remit basically to clean up the nuclear waste in the UK. So this is take two, take three, take four, whatever you like. Responsible for all the former nuclear sites from BNFL and the U UK Atomic Energy Authority, all these were given to the NDA, and they set up, particularly for the waste management, Radioactive Waste Management Limited. And their job was to find a way to do disposal. And they have their headquarters down at Harwell, and they will move to wherever the chosen site is. By the way, the one thing they did fix, low level waste, these are things like hospital rags, and a bit, bit of clothing and so on. That is, and you may know this, stored eight miles south of Sellafield at a place called Drig in drums. And that is a, a repository for very low level waste. And that is working very well. Now, um, the NDA set up Quorum. In, remember, RAWMAC was sort of, again, kicked in touch. Quorum, a committee on radioactive waste management, entirely independent experts appointed by government to decide what to do with our waste. They looked at a whole series of methods. This was NIREC's report suggesting what methods they look at. They looked at l disposal just below ground where you could retrieve the waste a little bit deeper down. They thought about putting it in subduction zones in the ocean, but that got banned. 
even putting it up in space, um, firing it at the sun. Well, the sun is a nuclear body, so give it some of its own back. The only trouble is you would need thousands and thousands of rockets, and one in five doesn't go off very well, so you'd have nuclear waste all over the place. But they did look at it. They talked about more seriously deep drilling into rock and putting the canisters down there. They talked about even injecting it straight down into the rock in a liquid form. All this, though, led to a report, and they said, whatever you, nuclear future, we must, doing nothing is not an option. So Coram said to the government, nothing option. What they said, and here we go again, geological disposal is the best approach, and we should proceed as soon as possible. But the second component was that volunteers, we should ask for volunteers, volunteer communities across the country who would take the waste. So down in the rocks and volunteers. The government said, fine, we will stick in the rocks down to 1,000 meters, 3,000 feet, and we'll stick all our high level and intermediate level waste down there. And it's probably going to cost 120 billion. So even more than HS2. And they also set up a stage for volunteering, which says you can, if you felt like you wanted the waste, you could express interest. There will be tests for suitability by the geological survey. The community will be asked. If they said yes, on they would go towards developing. So volunteering. Right, I'm now going to slightly digress. So we've decided we'll have a geological disposal facility, but what's it going to look like? Remember, it's going to last a million years going to be giant underground system which has got to last a million years and in terms of what we've been doing in the UK well we're not the UK sorry the world we've got some things we built for 5,000 years nothing for a million and the disposal facility will have two components one what they call the near field which is the engineered bit where the high level wastes and intermediate level wastes will be. And this has got to last for as long as it can, 10,000 years, 100,000 years maybe. And it's got to deal with water coming through, gas being given off, bugs, earthquakes, ice ages. Last as long as it can. And then the second part of the facility will be the rock, so-called far field. And that's the final frontier. And it's got to last maybe 90 or even 99 percent of the time so finding the right rock really important and the footprint how big will this facility be well those highest level wastes you can't stack them together they have to be well separated otherwise they go critical and you'd have a meltdown so the high level wastes have a very big footprint underground intermediate level waste you can stack together almost tin next to tin so they have quite a small print. And in terms of area, surface area, current um, amounts of waste, we need at least four square kilometers underground, which is about sort of central and just inner central Carlisle. With the new nuclear, we probably need nine kilometers of underground uh, facility. Enormous. And in those facilities, you probably need 14 kilometers of tunnels per square kilometer. And so if you're going for nine kilometers, you're up in the 60 kilometers of tunnels. The London Underground only has 180 kilometers of tunnels all told. So we're looking at something three times the size of, of in terms of uh, operations as the Channel Tunnel. What they will try and do is keep the waste in that near field as long as they can. And so what they're trying to get up is several barriers, multiple barriers in that near field to keep the waste in there as long as possible. First thing is, you try, the first barrier is the waste itself. You can turn it into glass, which lasts a while. Glass is not, doesn't last that long and is quite soluble. So they're talking about trying to put in mineral structures like zircons and garnets 
which we know last millions of years. The trouble is with that, incredibly expensive. The spent fuel, if you don't process your stuff, you have a spent fuel and that's sitting there as assemblies waiting to be um, encaged. And the second level is containment in canisters. They're working on some steels which are um, rust free and also don't break down due to radioactivity. And a lot of people now are talking about putting them in giant copper canisters. So you put your fuel rods and your, your glasses in giant copper canisters. You then put your canister and surround it by clay. Every nuclear facility, um, disposal facility involves clay. Clay is great because you can put blocks of clay around a canister. It rehydrates, it molds around the canister, it's impermeable, and it's highly re reactive in that clays have very big surface area, absorb things very well, and they exchange with uh, fluids and absorb the radionuclides. So clays are very important. And then also the, they will, the intermediate level waste goes into canisters and they use a lot of cement. And the problem with cement is that once it leach, leaks out, it might affect the local geology and affect the rocks. But the good news about cement, using cement in your facility, at high pH, the actinides, those are uranium, plutonium, are much, much less soluble. So a lot of cement is used in all models to reduce the solubilities of those long-lived long wastes once the uh, near field breaks down. Then you have cement vaults. You put all this in vaults, so more cement, and that's in your rock cavern. And again, the fact that this cement casing reduces the solubility of those long-lived level, long -lived wastes. Hopefully the short-lived wastes will have all broken down by now, and it's only your uranium, plutonium, neptunium you're worried about, and this will reduce their re reactivity. Now, and then the fifth barrier is the rock. Which rock? And you could probably have guessed some of these. <coughs> there people are talking about higher strength rocks to put them in, these things like granites, hard rocks, lower strength rocks, clays, and also evaporites. Now evaporites, salt deposits, are fantastic in that they're totally impermeable. The only thing about evaporites is you mustn't have evaporites near the surface because they dissolve. So in the UK, we are struggling, but others are much further on. And you could have, there are, um, 30 nuclear powers, about 50 countries with nuclear power stations, and they all seem to be doing rather better than we are, apart from the USA, um, at finding their dis disposal facilities. If you go around Europe, you'll find the Finns, the Swedes, they're using granites, German salt mines, Swiss mudstones, Belgians clays, the French, they're into clays. And just to take a couple of examples, and these are pertinent to the UK. There's the UK, big question mark, everybody else getting, getting, getting on. In Sweden, if you look at the geology of Sweden, all these colors here in Sweden are actually all very old rocks, 3.2 to 1.5 billion years old, old, hard, metamorphosed. And that's really all the Swedes have got. So they have to put it in those rocks and they have been looking for a facility and they have decided in 2009 to put it north of uh, Stockholm, a place called Fosmark, near a nuclear facility. And this is often the case, nuclear uh, areas, people who are already employed by nuclear don't mind more nuclear facilities, means jobs. And they are going to be operating hopefully by 2023 and actually putting their nuclear waste down into rocks. This is their rock. It's the same as you might have with your granite 
worktop, in your kitchen, totally impermeable, permeable, great. Slight drawback is that it doesn't react. So any of your, anything released, unlike your clays, it won't react with the radionuclides and these rocks crack. One crack and you have a bypass and it might, doesn't matter what the rock is. And of course, you're having to engineer this, blast it away. <coughs> so you have to, uh, it's not perfect. If you can find a big enough block of granite with no cracks in, you're, you're there. And what the Swedes are doing, they don't process their fuel. They take their whole fuel assembly, put it in a giant canister, put the canister in clay, and then put those clay in holes in the ground 500 meters down. And they say they're well on their way to dealing with it. The French, the French are ahead of us. They decided on geological disposal in 2006, same time as us. They licensed a site west of Paris in Jurassic uh, mudstones and clays, and they hope to, whoops, hope to be operational by 2025. And they have layers of clay, and these geology of this area west of Paris is identical to that of southern England. So the French are off and they've chosen clay. Why are clay so good? Well, they're very low permeability, maybe not as low as permeability as granite. They absorb radionuclides and clays, thick clay sequences mold. Okay, so back to the UK. Where are the right rocks? And where are the volunteers? Nobody putting their hands up, I can see, on the right of my screen. Um, so, the RWM Limited started looking at rocks. And they looked at the crystalline rocks, like Sweden, the clays, like France, and evaporites. Now, if you look for, oops, if you look for granites in the UK, these red blobs up in the Scottish Highland are granites, big granites, like some of the Swedish ones. If you go further to the Outer Hebrides, you've got 2.7 billion year old nices, lovely nices for your, uh, your radioactive waste. Unfortunately, the Scots said no. This is Alex Salmon. No disposal in Scotland. Gone. Which left us with England and Wales. Now, England, Wales, this is a geological map of England, Wales, the colours really represent different rock types. And number of granites, somewhat limited in the UK. There are one or two up in um, the Lake District, small ones, and some bigger ones down, as you probably know, in Cornwall. Dartmoor is a, is a possibility. Evaporites. Now, we do have evaporites in the UK. All our gas fields off in the North Sea are basically capped by salt. And there's layers of salt beneath which all the gas is that we've been using, burning away for the last 50 years. So evaporates are fantastic because they can even keep gas in, not just water, but gas. Do we have any on-field evaporites? Yep. 30 miles from here, Northwich, great big caverns in the salt. Perfect. Why not stick your waste in there? The problem is, if you look around the Nutsford area, you'll see the mirrors. You'll know Nutsford. And if you plot the salt horizon at the surface around Nutsford, it's this purple, and it exactly matches where those mirrors are. And the reason that those mirrors are there is because the salt has been at the surface and you get water ingress, it dissolves the salt, you get chlorides produced, which can move metals very easily, you get large scale collapse. And with the UK's wet climate, salt that's got near the surface is a non-starter. So vaporites out. What about clays? We have the same geology as the French. This green here is the Jurassic clays of Britain. Ammonites and dinosaurs made a lot of bricks near Peterborough lovely squishy clay down on the Jurassic coast, layers, thick layers of clay. Good for uh, nuclear waste disposal and the biggest and thickest clay 
probably that we could use is the London clay. It's very similar to the one that they're sticking the nuclear waste in in Belgium. Nice thick layers of clay. Um, they're digging under London through crossrail at the moment, through meters and meters of this clay. So there are good candidate rocks in the UK, but if you remember, we need volunteers. And who, vol who would volunteer? You could probably guess. We did get three people who volunteered, believe it or not, expressed an interest. And they were in Allerdale and Coopland councils in West Cumbria, their cellar field. They're fam familiar with nuclear. All the waste is there anyway. So they volunteered and Cumbria County Council volunteered, although they were a bit reluctant and they were given a veto at the end of the process by actually our Charles Hendry, our former uh, MP, who was energy minister back in 2011. But those were the volunteers. So you volunteer, you look at the geology and the geology of the Lake District, all these colors are different rock types. It's not exactly homogeneous. There's everything there, sandstones, granites, volcanics, limestones, mudstones. Really what you would like is a great big mass of something the same. But anyway, along came the British Geological Survey and they mapped unsuitable areas. Anything with resources like coal was taken out. Anything that had aquifers that might be contaminated was taken out. Anybody been some, some bees head, lovely sandstones there, very good water aquifers. Any habitation is taken out, Maryport, Workington, Whitehaven, but that did leave this area in here, in Coopland and Allerdale to look at. And if you look at the geology there, just below the surface, if you drill down, this is a cross section beneath Sellafield actually, you get into rocks, there are volcanics, they're very heterogeneous. There is a granite, it's very fractured, but possible, worth further investigation. Stage three of the volunteer asked the locals and looked, well, but looked very good. Overall in the, in the Lake District, Cumbria said 53% said, yep, go ahead. 33% said, no, nope. And uh, Coopland, where Sellafield is, 68% said, yep, go ahead. And the rest of Cumbria even said, 50% said, yeah, let's go ahead. So first three stages passed, but then Cumbria threw in the spanner and said, no. They used their veto and they voted seven to three. The three were all on the west of Cumbria, the seven, uh, with local elections looming, were from Penrith and places like that, and said no. And so they threw in their veto. Coopland voted six to one, four, but Cumbria threw in its veto. So, oops, back to square one. No more volunteers. New um, energy minister, Ed Davey, don't try and read all this. Uh, we respect the decision. Um, but he said the decision today will not undermine the prospect for new nuclear power. So forget the flowers report. We remain firmly committed to geological disposal. We remain fairly, remain committed to the principles of volunteerism. And they noted, and this is the key thing, that Coopland, so a local authority, a more local authority, voted in favor. So no more vetoes for whole counties. And so 2014, we're getting closer now to where we are. They decided this to do it the other way around this time. They would go around Britain and they would screen it to work out where the best places are for nuclear waste. So they look at the whole of Britain. There's a load of information on the geology of Britain. Look at it all and do a screening process and they've been doing that over the last four years three four years um 
And once they've found places, and they haven't actually published very much yet, then they would start discussions with communities, still looking for volunteers, but there are plenty of bribes going, um, and then move on and start finding out more about the local geology. So this time, look for the right geology, then try and persuade somebody to take your waste. The screening process underway at the moment, looking at rock type, the structure of the groundwater, earthquakes, any resources, everything is thrown in. So the whole of the UK has now been screened, and that includes us. We have been screened. You can find these are all open source publications. We are in the Pennine and adjacent areas, sub-region three. And this is our area, there's the Peak District, and they've looked around and they look at all the geology. And the only thing they really noticed about Buxton, and uh, there's Bakewell, there's Buxton, is that we have thermal springs. Yep, one, two, three, we know that. And there are some mineral veins. I don't know why they chose these particular ones, but they noticed that we had mineral veins. Also, it's limestone. And limestone, no one in the world is looking for limestone for nuclear waste disposal because it's full of caverns and fissures and water dissolves it out. And this is Poole's cavern. Um, and it is not a good candidate rock. So you might think, okay, Buxton, not a chance. But not quite so. Nearby, they noticed, and here shown in red, is that there are some mudstones of Carboniferous Age. Here's Buxton. You only have to go um, out towards Burbage or on towards Cavendish Golf Course, and there's some really nice mudstones there of Carboniferous Age, pretty well like the ones the French are using. And if you go out into the Cheshire Plain at depth, 1,000 meters, plenty of good mudstones. <coughs> so maybe, maybe. The only thing is, these mudstones are also a resource because these mudstones are exactly the same mudstones which are they're looking at for fracking gas at the moment. So it's in a bit of interesting conundrum there. Um, I haven't heard of anybody talking about these mudstones, certainly not at the moment. And also, just to remember, we are here, this is the structure of the peak district, very simplified, and we're a dome of limestone. And the limestone has variable thicknesses, but they put down a borehole at Woodale, five miles from where most of us are sat, and after 300 meters, it struck older rocks, Devonian rocks, actually. And then there, below there, there are also Silurian rocks, some mudstones, some shales. And they are well within the 1,000 meter envelope. So down here, and it's a very stable basement beneath the limestone, there might be candidate lithologies, although it would be very expensive to find out. So maybe, you know, the BCA could consider, you know, you get a million quid for just saying, oh, we're interested. Um, anyway, the consultations with the communities is supposed to be ongoing. I have not heard yet of any community that's having discussions. Um, and they're talking about 15 to 20 years of discussion before they select a site and then 100 years of construction. So that's going to take us another 20 years from where we are. Um, so we're going to be 2040. And if you remember, in, 19, in 1976, where we started looking for this geodisposal facility. And we are really no nearer. And even when a site is identified, they're going to have to do an enormous amount of work to look at the whole near and far field package. Every bit of the rock and the fractures and the faults and the water and everything. And then they're going to have to model it for a million years. And I just, you know, remember only 20,000 years ago, we were covered in ice. There was a, ice over us, completely changes the hydrology. So that's nothing in the time frame of the geological disposal. If sea level rises three, three degrees, this will be Sellafield. 
that'll be Scarfell Pike. So you have to model all these things in to a geological disposal thing. And that is a real challenge, a million years. What they've tried to do, and there's a reason why I'm talking about this, you'll see in a moment, is they look at analogs and they found in Jordan some rocks which were cooked by basalt to look like cement 600,000 years ago. And now they're looking at the behavior of that cement now 600,000 years later as an analog for what would happen to the near field in a facility. And also there's another place they've been looking at for analogs, would you believe, Harper Hill. Now you've probably all seen the tufa that comes out from beneath the uh, site for the health and safety site. And it's a nice white tufa. And the BGS and University of Manchester are actually looking at that because the leachates here are very, very similar to what the leachates would be coming out of a nuclear facility. And there's a, even a report on that. So Harper Hill is part of the geodisposal story. Now, as a colleague of mine who's very close to the process, part of the process, said, I hope to God they get this right. The mess they've made in the past can't be repeated. He also didn't like politics. And he's quite right. We just need to get on and decide. But still, we have no geological disposal facility. I hope you've enjoyed listening. <laughs>